Hey guys, welcome to the start of an in-depth tutorial series on restoring a vintage black and white TV from the late 40s. But it's going to be a little bit different. It's not just going to be what I usually do, which is start out with the chassis out of the cabinet, recap, power it up, and fingers crossed hopefully it works. No, what I plan on doing is explaining methodically, step by step, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, what each circuit is for, and how it does what it needs to do. And I'll work in some theory about the type of receive signal and how the various signal circuits pick out parts of the signal and eventually paint the picture on the screen. So why am I starting out here in the garage? Well, one, it's a gorgeous day. <laughs> we went from 15 degrees to 55 degrees in about 48 hours, so I'm enjoying the little reprieve in winter here. Uh, but also, that's where the TV we're going to work on is currently stored. But before we get to it, I want to talk a little bit about what to look for in picking up a TV. Some trouble signs. I got a lot of feedback to the video where I proposed doing this series and you guys brought up a lot of topics on things I hadn't talked about much before. One of which is what do you do about unobtainium parts? Meaning if something uh, as bad is burned out you can't just go to Radio Shack and buy a new flyback for example. Well, the reason you haven't heard me talk much about that in my videos is I choose what I work on. Uh, when somebody drops off the stuff for me to work on or I'm out in the field considering making a purchase I look for certain things and if I see signs of trouble I tend to avoid it so generally speaking I have to deal with it because I don't work on sets that don't that have parts that I can't get <laughs> simply put but also, there's a reason why I tend to work on radios from the 30s and TVs from the 40s. They were really well made, generally speaking. They were over-engineered, used very robust parts. I don't think I've ever encountered a bad flyback or yoke, or power transformer. Oh, so how do I avoid doing that? Well, one, when you look, take the back off the set, get a flashlight, use the, the light on your phone, and really look at everything. Okay, so one, make sure it's all there. And if you're not sure what it's supposed to look like, try to find some photos online of the of other, other examples of the set before you even go. If you get the Sam's Photo Facts, great because they have photos of what the chassis actually looks like. Some sets, when there's multiple chassis, might be missing an entire chassis. Or maybe somebody's working on it and gave up and there's significant parts missing. So the one obvious thing is a picture tube. Make sure it doesn't have a busted picture tube, necked. If the neck is broken off, usually on the front of the screen there'll be a, a dark spot in the middle where the phosphor was blown off by the inrush of air when the vacuum was broken. Ideally, you can bring a picture tube tester with you. Get a cheap one. Get a B&K 440. Uh, it works with any picture tube, generally speaking, up to the early 60s. Now, if you're thinking about working on an electrostatic set, that's a whole different ball game because no tester can really accurately tell you how bright and sharp the image is going to be other than to put it in a working set and check it out. There's a lot of them out there. They're small, they're lightweight, which I think is why a lot of them have survived. They generally all use a 7JP4 pitcher tube. Really hard to get replacements for. So that's one reason why I'm doing this Admiral set. It's magnetic deflection using a 10 BP4 or 12 LP4. Two of the most common. The 10 BP4 was the workhorse standard pitcher tube used in most sets from 46 to 49 or so. Readily, well, <laughs> as far as vintage pitcher tubes go, it's readily available. Uh, I should say you shouldn't have too much trouble finding one. Again, you can't just go to the corner store and buy one. But there are lots of spared used ones floating around out there. So, picture tube. Yeah, by all means, 
try as best you can to either test it or be prepared to find a replacement. Power transformer and coils in general, look to see if it's fried. For power transformers, toast. Sometimes you can actually smell it or look for drip it, dripped wax or tar or charred wires around that area. That can often happen if somebody finds a set in their basement or attic and they just plug it in and turn it on until smoke starts coming out of it. A common reason that happens is filter capacitor has failed, uh, either very low resistance or is dead short, which puts a really heavy load on the power transformer and rectifier tubes or selenium rectifiers, eventually something's going to give. Either the rectifier tube is going to start red plating and burn out or the power transformer is going to start overheating and smoking or both. So look for any general signs of distress, of any charring, any odor, any dripping uh, st stuff, substances out of capacitors or transformers. Similarly the yoke Again, I haven't found a bad yoke, but I surmise if it, it looks really corroded or you see signs of it's, it's been tinkered on, maybe it's been loosened up and pulled back or disconnected or wires cut to it, potential trouble sign. Also, of course, try to get it set for as little as possible, and if you see any potential trouble signs, point it out to the seller and start chipping away at that price. Because you may have to abandon the project or invest money to get the parts you need. The ultimate source for parts, unfortunately, is to get another set, to get another chassis. I highly recommend you to the Early Television Foundation Museum in Ohio. They have a big convention auction swap meet in May and just a quick swap meet in October. That's the best place where you're going to find just a bare chassis to scavenge parts from. And they also have an inventory. They have, they have picture tubes there, used and new. They have yokes, they have flybacks. So if you ever need anything, that's your number one go-to. Number two go-to would be eBay, uh, three other collectors on Facebook. Yeah, I know, well, if you need to join Facebook and join some groups just to find parts, that's where a lot of people have gone to. Otherwise, forums, Antique Radio Forum, Video Karma, but to be honest, membership there and activity there has dropped off in favor of Facebook. Uh, so, I'm familiar with the Admiral TV. It's a very solid design. I've worked on several of them in the past. So when I saw this was available, I grabbed it and a, a large part of my thought was that was to do a series like this because I know it's easy to work on. And that's another thing, before you decide to work on a set, especially if it's your first set, do some research first. Don't just pounce on it, well, I shouldn't say that. Pounce on it by all means if it's nearby and it's cheap, but maybe you don't want to work on it right away if it's, say, a Predicta. They're not the easiest things to work on. Or a proje projection set, or... Uh, one of the early, like an RCA 630TS, yeah, they're great sets, it's the first model they put out, they work very well. There's a lot of caps, crumbly wiring, and they're not the easiest things to work on. This is an easy set to work on. People ask me, what do you recommend for a beginner set? This is it. Yeah, the electrostatic sets are, they're small, they're lightweight, you can ship them and all that, but they're, they're kind of weird, they use different circuitry. They use parts that are expensive to get. Magnetic sets, yes, they're bigger, they're heavier, but that's because they have big power transformers. They tend to not break. They tend to work well. All right, so let's assuming you found a good candidate, late 40s, early 50s, sat with a good picture tube, no obvious signs of trouble. You need to get it home. So how do you transport a TV? especially at the TV of this size. Shipping, not very practical. If it's something you really, really want, I suggest you use a, a service like U-Ship. I recently had a very, a 300 pound projection set shipped from Colorado to Chicago. I think it was around 300 bucks. And it did a, a great job. Uh, Two guys put it, picked it up, put it in their truck, and drove it to my door and unloaded it. 
put it in my garage. White glove service, basically. Crate and freighter is another option, but that will cost you significantly more. They will literally come to your place and build a crate and pack it, and then ship it on a pallet. Expect to pay well over 500 bucks for something like that. But hey, if it's an early color roundy or something like that, that might be worth it. It might be worth it. But ideally, you can pick it up yourself. So here is the set I picked up. So how do you transport it? Well, the first thing you always, always, always want to do is make sure the chassis is secured. Typically, there's four bolts. In this case, we have two chassis, so there should be four bolts on each chassis. Coming up from the bottom, typically something like a 3 8 inch head bolt on it. And make sure at least two of them are present and secure because you do not want this falling up. I've had some close calls. Other folks have told me they have <laughs> had chassis fall out. You need to pick up the set and it just slides right out and smash. So, good idea to bring a socket set with you. Now, another option is if you do have tools and have the time, is take the chassis out and put it on the passenger seat, something like that. If you are feel comfortable, you know how to disconnect everything and pull it out. Usually there's going to be a couple wires going to the speaker and the speaker is mounted to the cabinet. If that's the case, be very careful, disconnect it, don't poke your, your fingers through the speaker cone and disconnect it. In this case, we have two chassis, so you have to disconnect them from each other. There's a cable here that just pulls out. But in this case, I did ship it all together. I could reach under there and feel the bolts were secure. Also make sure the picture tube is secure. In this case, it was not, and I got very lucky. I saw the chassis were secure and, and just figured I was good to go. There's supposed to be a cloth band going around in the front of the pitcher tube to hold it down tight to the chassis. It's missing. This pitcher tube could have easily slipped to one side or the other and, and snapped the neck off. This is a really, really weak point on these. We'll talk about that more when I pull this off because I need to replace that. And these Admiral sets, that is the main thing, basically the only thing holding the pitcher tube down. And it's missing. Actually, on closer inspection, it's not missing. It's just here. <laughs> it's supposed to be all the way at the front and going over the front of it. It clearly has slipped off. So it's not doing a darn thing. So this picture tube, it's just weight, right? It's gravity holding it down right now. That's it. All right, now we have the lower chassis, which is secured. There's bolts coming up from the bottom into the chassis plate through the wood but also the wood is screwed down. So when it goes to securing this or taking this out, you have two choices. You can leave the wood in place and take the screws out of the chassis, or leave the chassis screwed to the wood and take these out and take the whole board with it. And similarly, under top, the typical cabinet construction, poplar and plywood that's veneered. So this deck is, is plywood, and our bolts coming up below with big fender washers on them. And uh, two in the front, two in the back. Very straightforward setup. So again, if I was looking for trouble signs, if I saw oozing around the power transformers, if they looked baked and the paint had, had come off, if these wires were charred, if these wires were cut, if any of this was missing or hanging loose or had been cut off, if this the high voltage cage cover was missing, and there was some monkey business in there, wires cut, missing parts, all those warning signs. Uh, it's not that unusual to see tubes missing. That I wouldn't be too concerned about. All these tubes are extremely readily available. And it's common enough for kids. I did it myself when I was a kid. Pluck them out and, and throw them at the sidewalk to break them, just to have fun. <laughs> or people pluck them out to sell them on eBay. I think they're worth a fortune for the audio crowd or something like that. There are no audiophile grade tubes in these sets. And I see some original sets. If you're looking for something extra special, it's neat to have tubes that are branded the same as the set. And if you see different colors, that's because some are original and replacements, I think, are the ones that usually have yellow or red or a different color. In other words, they went back to the dealer or dealer authorized service center and they had tubes replaced there rather than just buying them on their own. All right. And then, uh, look for rodent droppings, corrosion, that kind of thing. This is what you want to see. A little bit of dust and dirt, 
70 plus years old, no big deal. There's no corrosion. There are no cut wires. Heck, we even have the power cord in pretty good shape. Everything's here. The back is missing though. That's not at all uncommon. It would be great to have it. Every set had a back originally. Not a lot of radios didn't, but TVs always did. They didn't want people poking their fingers in here. There should be a metal mesh back on that. You can see where the holes are where it would be secured. Yeah, it'd be great to have it. I'm not going to be turned away from a sale. I'm look around. It's, it's really common for sets to be missing their backs. You can make a new one out of Masonite. It's not the end of the world. And it would not have one for the lower half, just the top half. All right, so if the chassis are secure and you want to transport it all intact, how do you do that? How do you lay it in your car? Myself, if it's all secure, I like to put it on the side. Reason being, I don't want to put it on the back because I don't want any chance of this getting busted off. Even, uh, even though it's pretty flush, that CRT base is right at the edge. They do have this board sticking out to help protect it a little bit. I'm not going to rely on that. I don't want this CRT to slide back a little bit and this to break off, so I wouldn't do that. A lot of folks recommend putting it face down. Maybe with some sets, I'm wary of that on this set for two reasons. One, the knobs stick out. I don't want to damage the knobs or the control shafts. Two, this. It's plastic. Some sets have uh, safety glass. This has safety plastic. I'd be worried about cracking that. You're not going to be able to replace it. It's reverse painted. It's specialized. I don't want any chance of damaging that stuff. So just put it on its side. And that's what I did and had no issues whatsoever. Also, be prepared. These are heavy. This is one of the smaller, lighter weight of consoles. But even so, we've got a lot of iron down there. Total weight of this, 75 pounds, somewhere in that ballpark. And even if you are strong and healthy and young, uh, it's still an awkward thing to pick up and put into your car. <laughs> so. Even if you can lift it up, it's nice to have help if you're going to put it on its side and then place it gently down and then get it back out. But uh, I have a hatchback Honda, so it's easy enough to pop open. I always bring plenty of blankets, moving blankets with me, whatnot. Pop open the hatch, lay it on its side on some blankets, put some blankets around it, make sure it doesn't really shift much. Because even if it is all secure and all that, you, don't, you also don't want to damage the finish. This one's pretty rough so I wasn't too concerned about it, but it's always nice to avoid adding any more damage to it. Once I got it home, got some help, lifted it out, set it down. The feet. Be wary of what surface you put this on if you're going to be moving it around. Originally, just about every set I've ever seen had metal caps underneath it. Metal disc, oh, around that big around with a nail or a screw just driven in. This has four chunky wood feet, about two inch square, with a metal cap on it. So you don't want to put this on a hardwood floor and then push on it, because <laughs> you'll scratch your floor. I'm not sure what the common flooring was back in the 40s. I would have thought wood was pretty common, so I don't know why they put metal feet on these, but they did. So, inside we have a combination of hardwood floors, linoleum, and carpeting. Depending on where I put this, I change out the feet. If it's going on wood, I put felt. If it's going on carpet, I put uh, furniture slides underneath it. Linoleum, I'll leave the metal. But uh, you definitely don't want to scratch up your floors. And sometimes the feet are gone, they might, be a, they might have corroded, there might be some sharp metal down there. While you've got it out in the garage or whatnot, tip it back and take a look at what's going on with the feet and take appropriate measures. Okay, you've got it home safely. Now what? You wanna check it out. You wanna pull out the chassis. I would not recommend you just take this and plug it into the wall. Yeah, if you have a dim bulb tester and you keep an eye on it, you can. I generally don't bother because I don't even care. There's, there's a possibility I could plug this in right now and get a raster. The reason I don't care is I know I'm going to restore it. I know I'm going to work on it. I know it needs work. 
So, yeah, it'd be nice to verify that a few things are working, but we're going to do that as we work on it anyways. In other words, when I decide I'm going to work on something, I'm going to work on it and get it working. I have spare parts for Admirals if I need any, so I'm not concerned about checking that everything is working or good right now. You might be, and yeah, if... If you can coax a rafter out of it, that basically tells you that everything is good. The flyback, the power transformer, the yoke, the pitcher too. In the past, I was more hesitant to uh, say, oh, never plug it in. If you've been watching my videos, you've seen me plug plenty of things in, as is. I still wouldn't do it with this set, though, even if I was, wanted to, without being able to look underneath the chassis. All this looks fine. I don't have any issues with either one of these chassis from the top side. The previous owner told me he thinks his dad or his grandfather had tinkered around with it. I have no idea what's going on underneath this chassis. If there's a cutout, like there is in these, I think, uh, but there's a screen over it. Some, some have cutouts and you can get underneath there, get on your back, get a flashlight, and you can check it out. This I can't really. So I really want to just get this thing inside and get it on the workbench before I think about doing anything more with it. So now we do want to get those chassis bolts out. So get out your socket set, get a plastic container hand lead to save all your nuts and washers and whatnot. Take reference photos, use your phone. In this day and age, we've all got numerous ways to take pictures. Take pictures of everything. Take out your bolts, disconnect your speaker, in this case, you need to pull this out, make sure the power cord is not somewhere where you're going to trip on it. Start sliding out this chassis. It's going to be heavy. These metal sides typically just come straight down, so if you put your hands under them, it can hurt. It's going to dig into your skin. Maybe grab some rag or put some gloves on so you reach under there. But also be careful when you reach under there that your fingers don't dig into something and you break some wires or damage some coils or whatnot. It's a lot to take in if you've never pulled one of these out before. It's a, com a horrible combination of being really heavy and really fragile. And you cannot drop it. I don't care if you stub your toe or whatever, suck it up. You cannot drop this. because <laughs> The picture tube will explode. Uh, you can damage the chassis or whatever. So just make sure that the dogs are put away, cats away, and there's nothing in your, in your immediate vicinity and you have somewhere safe to put it down before you start pulling this out. This could be surprisingly heavy. And then more of the same for the bottom chassis. Not as challenging because you don't have a pitcher tube on it, but it probably actually might weigh more than the top chassis. Discharging the pitcher tube, I get asked about that a lot. This set hasn't been turned on in, in decades, I suspect. I don't need to discharge anything. But if you did, we're talking about this. This is where the high voltage comes in. It's very easy to pull these off. And there's your high voltage connection. So this is what you care about. There's a metal button up there. We'll take a closer look at it when I'm out of the cabinet and you can see it better. There is a metal button there that goes through the glass to the inside. That's where your high voltage goes through. If you needed to discharge it, take a screwdriver, ground it. Take an alligator clip, a wire with an alligator clip on each end. Clip one end to this. Clip the other end of the screwdriver shaft and touch it to that. Ideally, you put a resistor in series with it. 100K, 470K, 1 meg, something like that. Because surprisingly, this is a weird effect. If you just directly short it to ground, you're gonna get, if it's charged up, you get a little bit of a spark. Not a big deal. Take your screwdriver away. Wait a couple minutes. Touch the screwdriver again. It's going to spark again. There's a weird effect that if you rapidly discharge it, it kind of sends shock waves through. It's, it's a capacitor. It sends shock waves through the dielectric and it, re, it rebuilds the charge. It doesn't completely discharge it. If you do it, think of it like sort of uh, like an echo or a spring rebounding. However, if you discharge it a little more slowly, a little more controlled way, you don't get that. So, grounded insulated tool of some sort with a resistor in series of at least a few hundred K to safely discharge a pitcher tube.
Now you don't have to discharge it to get it out. If you leave this, this nice insulated rubber cap on here, that's something I never even think about because I, I rarely am pulling a chassis out of a set that's been turned on at any time. The, ch the charge will bleed away naturally on its own over the course of hours or days. Once we're started working on it and we've powered it up, that's a different story. But for now, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about it unless you know literally the seller had just turned it on before you bought it. All right, so we're going to get out a wrench, ratchet, take out these bolts, carefully slide these chassis out. Well, remember to disconnect the wiring first. We're going to get them inside, get them on the workbench. And then we got a whole lot more to talk about. I think that's enough for now. I want to keep these segments to a manageable length. When we pick up next time, we'll have these chassis on the workbench and we're going to start getting a feel for what work we need to do and where the different sections are located and we'll take a look at the schematic. Thanks for watching.